This is a good one. Coming up next, the story of a mini rock symphony from a band that was once dismissed by critics as a, a bubblegum group that was focused on only making money. Uh, that's funny because they're a big rock band. But with their final big hit, this band reached the pinnacle of their artistry, delivering a track that was a complete departure from their usual sound. Sadly, though, their redemptive success was short-lived as their lead singer left the band amidst uh, deteriorating health. I mean, at one point, he landed in the ER for emergency heart surgery, and on the operating table, he suffered 12 consecutive heart attacks, but he somehow still survived. The story of how this musical triumph was created and why this band should be so much more revered and what happened to one of the pioneers of glam rock. The story is coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you ever tried to find your name on those cheap keychains that you saw in convenience stores, you're going to dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia, whether it was a license plate or a whatever, a shoe. Make sure to click the subscription button below and the notification, uh, check the notifications so you know when our interviews are coming out. And check us out on Patreon and our merch below. You know, from 1971 to 1975, they were one of the biggest bands in the UK and one of the top groups of the glam rock movement, if not the top. But after a three-year dry spell with no hit singles, it was the unorthodox mini-rock symphony Love is Like Oxygen that catapulted the band sweep back into the international spotlight. Love is like oxygen. You get the iconic riff from Andy Scott is easily the most unforgettable part of Love is Like Oxygen, but there's so much more to this track than just you know, a catchy guitar line. When you consume the full six minute and 53 second album version of the song, it was featured on Level Headed Sweet's sixth studio album, it's an exhilarating musical journey. You'll hear the catchy rock harmonies and melodies that define the sound of Sweet, but you also hear operatic and classical elements that you never thought you would ever hear from this band. The extended version showcases the band's ability to, to blend powerful rock with orchestral intensity turning a great song into a, a full-blown musical experience. I mean, Sweet was smoking hot in 1975. They had back-to-back -back hits from their album Desolation Boulevard, and the lead single from the record Fox on the Run soared to number two in the UK, and it went to number five here in the Billboard Hot 100. was followed by the rip, roar, and banger action, which peaked at number 15 in the UK and number 20 here. It was a smash around the globe. It shot all the way to number two in the Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark, and Germany. Sweet was on fire. And that's why everybody wants a piece of the action. But then Sweet's hot streak dramatically cooled off. It severed ties with hitmakers Nicky Chin and Mike Chapman. And they were determined to control their own destiny with you know, no outside interference. They wanted to do their own thing. The success of Fox on the Run in action, the first singles written and produced without Chin and Chapman, most definitely gave this band the confidence that they had made the right decision to go their own way, to write their own stuff. But futility over two subsequent album releases made their label extremely nervous with this band. Lead guitarist Andy Scott wrote most of the lyrics for Love Is Like Oxygen in 76, but then he tucked them away because he really hadn't come up with the right music to bring you know, to his bandmates to record. So in late 1977, Sweet was in Paris, France at the Chateau Studios. You know, they're getting ready to record what became Level Headed. On uh, one night, uh, drummer Mick Taylor, singer Brian Connolly, and bassist Steve Priest had left after a long day of recording. And Andy, he stayed behind to continue working on some tunes. A young sound engineer at the studio by the name of Trevor Griffin took advantage of uh, the opportunity to play Andy some keyboard parts that he'd been composing. The music it was more classical than it was rock and roll. Trevor's concept was to create a symphonic rock piece, you know, something along the lines of the progressive rock of Supertramp at the time, you know, with a dramatic double arpeggio sound. Andy knew that Trevor was a marvelous keyboard player, but he, he just had no idea that he had a gift for composing like he did. 
He was shocked by what Trevor played for him. It was spirited. It was beautiful. It was fresh. As a fellow musician, Andy appreciated the artistry behind this. Although it was a much different style than what Sweet was known for, Andy thought there was potential for it to be crafted into something really cool. So Andy started putting guitar licks over Trevor's keyboard arrangement. And he started to get a good feel, you know, to blend Trevor's Rachmaninoff flavored classical parts with his rock guitar line. He went back to his flat and he dug in on the music on the eight track at his home studio. And he suddenly remembered his lyrics for love is like oxygen. He had that in his back pocket. And he fashioned the lyrics around the music track that he and Trevor had constructed together, performing the vocals himself. Some things are better left unsaid. The following Monday, he played the demo of Love Is Like Oxygen at the Chateau for his bandmates. Now, when the nearly seven minute demo faded out, there was complete silence in the room. And you recalled that it was drummer Mick Taylor that spoke first. There it is. Let's record that. He was excited. Love is like oxygen. Andy and Trevor instructed Steve Priest to play the bass parts in more of a classical style. And in the midsection of the song, Mick played on a timing bar using only a hi-hat. There was no click track. Mick, who was blessed with the ability to sing in a higher range, joined Andy to sing the chorus of the song. It was just exquisite. And now all they needed was Brian to sing the verses. Now, this was a challenge at that moment because Brian Connolly, he became increasingly unreliable. You know, his drinking problem was only getting worse and there were many days when Brian didn't even show up for recording sessions. Andy told the band's manager to sober Brian up and get him to the studio the next morning because they needed a great vocal from him. Now, fortunately, Brian made it to the studio and he delivered what Andy called his best vocal performance. And I have to agree. Always comes before you know, the avant-garde style of a Love Is Like Oxygen, that marked quite a departure for Sweet, right? which is exactly what intrigued Andy Scott about the track in the first place. To refine its unique sound, he brought in the talented pianist, uh, Jeff Wesley, to perfect the arrangement. Andy had a strong feeling that Jeff would bring that final polished touch and his instincts couldn't be more spot on. <music> Stephen Mick, however, didn't care for Jeff and his ideas, but in the end, Andy won the Battle of Wills because, you know, after all, it was his composition. Now, when the collaboration of Trevor Griffin, Jeff Wesley, and the four members of Sweet were finished recording Love Is Like Oxygen, uh, it was indeed a mini rock symphony of the highest regard, clocking in at six minutes and 53 seconds. The Sweet Quartet submitted eight or nine songs to their manager, David Walker, and the NR team of their record label to discuss what would make the final cut for the album, Level Headed. Much to their chagrin, though, David and the NR guys didn't hear a hit amongst those. They told the band they needed the money song. Did you, do you have anything else is what they said. So this is when Andy made them aware of Love Is Like Oxygen. He didn't even send it to him because he didn't think it was commercial enough. He said to him, we do have another track that we recorded recently, but it's very different. You know, he just didn't think the song was commercial enough to be a single, so he never sent it to him. So when Andy played the recording for David Walker and the label Tastemakers, they flipped out. David said, and they quote, where have you been hiding this song? I mean, the song was obviously in need of an edit for radio, but the management and the label, they were excited about Love Is Like Oxygen being the song they felt that would put Sweet back on the map. As the lead single from Level Headed, Love Is Like Oxygen steadily climbed the charts, becoming Sweet's third all-time best-selling single, behind only Fox on the Run and Ballroom Blitz. It was indeed that magical track that ultimately brought the band back to their former glory. They were ready for another shot at the title. Love is Like Oxygen, it was a smash around the world. It popped to number six in New Zealand, Switzerland, and Germany, 
was a number nine single in Australia and the UK, and it went to number eight in Canada, Belgium, Ireland, Denmark, and here in the US in the Billboard Hot 100 in the spring of 78. In Finland, the single went to number seven. The radio edit of Love Is Like Oxygen is a tight rock hit, but it is a redacted version of the remarkable symphonic brilliance of the album version. There are so many magnificent sections or movements on the original full recording, you really have to give Andy Scott, Trevor Griffin, Jeff Wesley, Mick Tucker, Steve Priest, and Brian Connolly the highest of praise for creating such a, a, a phenomenal track. And to take such a huge risk that was such a departure from their sound, they had no idea people you know, would, would accept it, would hear it. You know, Sweet was never a critical darling. In fact, the critics were very, very cruel to this band. They hated them, it seemed like. They just never gave them any artistic credit. The so-called tastemakers of the press condemned Sweet for being too commercial, and they were all about the money. They had no artistic integrity. The album version of Love Is Like Oxygen definitely redeemed the band from that perennial snubbing. In late 78, the song was honored with a Song of the Year nomination at the prestigious Ivor Novello Awards, although it was beaten by Jerry Rafferty's Baker Street. So, you know, it was never a thing, but there is a curious subplot regarding the lyric of the chorus of Love Is Like Oxygen and the lyric found in The Bridge of Grounds for Separation by Daryl Hall and John Oates. Like the chorus in Love Is Like Oxygen is Love Is Like Oxygen, you get too much, you get too high, not enough, and you're gonna die. While the lyric in The Bridge of Grounds for Separation goes like this. Music, it's my life and I've got it in me, but isn't it a bit like oxygen where too much will make you high, but not enough will make you die? Daryl and John included Grounds for Separation on their self-titled fourth studio album in 1975, whereas Andy Scott claimed that he wrote Love is Like Oxygen in 76. Again, no issue was brought forth about plagiarism, but the lyrics are kind of similar there. Makes you wonder a little bit. Sometimes you get the same inspiration at the same time. Too much will make you high. So the success of Love Is Like Oxygen, it had everyone feeling incredible about the future of Sweet. You know, the track built up new momentum with a musical progression that should have propelled the band into the 80s and well beyond. But, and that's a big but, there was a growing problem with Brian Connolly's uh, serious alcohol issue. It gotten much worse since he was nearly beaten to death years before. Now, we covered this in an earlier video about Sweet, but to give you a recap, during the sessions for the Ballroom Blitz, Brian Connolly was the victim of a vicious attack on High Street in Staines, England. Uh, the details of the attack was mixed. You know, Andy Scott claimed that Connolly was just trying to protect his Mercedes from a couple of, of dorks who were stomping on the hood of the car. Uh, Steve Priest gave a more sinister account, though. He said that Connolly was the target of a setup job. Now, according to Priest, Connolly was being told by unknown persons who waited until he parked his car at a pub to buy some cigarettes. And Connolly, you know, had allegedly angered one of the passengers in the pursuing vehicle because he was flirting with his girlfriend. That's what he said. When Connolly got out of his car, three guys jumped him. They beat the living hell out of him. One of the attackers kicked Connolly in the throat when he lied on the ground, and Brian heard him say, that should do the job. Uh, in an apparent effort to retaliate by smashing Brian's vocal cords, he must have known who he was. It was so bad they had to cancel six months of shows, including touring with The Who, one of their favorite bands. The beating reportedly permanently damaged Connolly's singing ability, diminishing his once effortless voice range and it led to even heavier drinking. This was a major problem. Now the album level had and marked the end of an era for Sweet. It was the last album to feature the band's classic lineup. And about a year after its release, Brian Connolly decided to part ways with a group to pursue a solo career. And his official announcement in February of 78, Brian Ashley stated that he was leaving Sweet to pursue a solo career in country rock. That may have been a bit of a joke because Brian never delved into any form of country music. 
But Brian always contended that it was his decision to split. When his issues came to a head, it was a very emotional time. I mean, the band members loved Brian. He was very kind, a very affable man, but he had you know, become a liability that cost the band a lot of money. They had to cancel their American tour after a disastrous performance at a concert in Alabama. It was in front of 20,000 people. And Brian was so drunk, he was incoherent, had to be removed from the stage altogether. The debacle led to the scrapping of their entire sold out tour. That was big. Despite Brian's departure, the remaining trio, Steve Priest, Andy Scott, and Mick Tucker carried on. They actually released three more commercially unsuccessful albums together before eventually calling it quits in late 81. In what should have been their big comeback, the band sputtered. And uh, though their influence would be felt throughout the 80s in bands like Motley Crue and Whitesnake and Def Leppard and Poison and Bon Jovi and glam metal in general, the band would be largely forgotten. This has always perplexed me. Sweet was easily one of the most influential bands of the 70s. They sold 35 million records. They had 15 hits, huge hits. I mean, we still hear them today. So why did they disappear from the zeitgeist? Why are they a mere footnote in rock history? Why aren't they in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Let me know your take in the comments below. The truth is, even if Brian had stayed with them, the band would have faced some hard times because his health was getting worse and worse and worse. Let me explain. After the band splintered with Andy assembling his own group that he presented as sweet, Steve did the same thing when he moved to LA, while Brian and Mick bounced around with various incarnations. Brian's health rapidly deteriorated after he left Sweet. At one point, he was rushed to the hospital where he experienced, get this, 12 heart attacks before he miraculously recovered. Still, Brian's life was cut short because of his alcohol abuse, because of getting attacked, because of his health. He died from a stroke and a massive heart attack in 97, just shy of his 52nd birthday. Five years later, in 2002, Mick Tucker died from leukemia. He was only 54. Steve Priest, whose deep voice delivered the Gonna Die reprise in the chorus of Love Is Like Oxygen, was the next core member to go. He died in 2002 at 72. Andy Priest is alive and kicking and still making music as the sole survivor of the original suite, going back to the beginning when the act was known as The Suite. In fact, Andy was recently approached by a gentleman named Alex Barry Sparks, the bassist from the band Dokken asking him to participate in the Love Is Like Oxygen All-Star Project. As a co-writer of the track, Andy was asked to perform on a 16-minute modern reimagining of Love Is Like Oxygen by a group of all-star musicians. Joining Scott and Sparks were Simon Phillips, Michael Shanker from Toto, Friedrich Ackeson from Opeth, and Tony Carey from Rainbow. You know, Sweet were a lot of things. They were difficult, they were excessive, they were arrogant even. But they were also incredibly talented. When Brian Connolly died in 97, the top of the pop show in the UK did a special tribute episode. Uh, the host of the program, Johnny Walker, called Brian the godfather of glam. So true. You're not wrong for love in their prime, the four members of Sweet, McTucker, Steve Priest, Andy Scott, and Brian Connolly, were an extraordinary band. They evolved from what the critics call bubblegum with Little Willie, their highest charting single in the US at number three, Willie, Willie to the all-time classic hit Ballroom Blitz, to the inspired mini rock symphony with their last hit, Love Is Like Oxygen. Sweet not only deserve better, they're one of the reasons that hard rock and heavy metal romance the masses in the 80s. Surely they deserve to be enshrined in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame since many of their bands that are in there were direct descendants of their music. Time will tell. Leave us a comment about Sweet. What are your memories of this amazing song and this band and their greatest hits? Let's have a great discussion below. How are they not more revered? I just don't get it. I've always been a fan of Sweet. I think they're one of the great bands of the 70s. Let's have a great celebration below. What do you think happened? Why aren't they more known? 
Let's have a great discussion. If you like our content, we invite you to come around, subscribe, be a part of this. Till next time, three courts and the truth, my friend.